always hard to make. But um, my name is Melissa McGregor, and I'm a senior consultant, as you know. But I'm um, also a home office. And today I'll be telling you about machine learning and how you can use it to improve your UI and UX. So how many of you are familiar with Skynet? So basically, we're going to learn how to make Skynet more user friendly. Just a quick little overview of what I'll be going through today. Um, we'll have some background on neural networks and how those work. And we'll go through Brain.js and kind of why I chose it over TensorFlow. Then we'll get more into the technical part. So we'll talk about how do you decide what features to use for your machine learning model. And then we'll get into how to train that model to understand your user's behavior. And we'll talk about using your model to make live updates to the DOM. So before we get into the neural networks, how many of you are familiar with neural networks or machine learning in general? Okay, that's a pretty good split. So nice. Um, basically, neural networks are just algorithms that you can use to make predictions. It's a math equation where you put in data and you get out stuff. And so, neural networks are made of layers of nodes. And a node is kind of like a neuron in your brain. It takes in a bunch of different inputs, so that could be like what you see or stuff that you hear and touch around you. And it goes through this different set of equations that it makes up, where that determines how it impacts the overall output. And as it filters down, you get your output, which is kind of the value that you're looking for when you make your model. And one of the things I hope that I can clear up really fast within machine learning and kind of deep learning, deep learning is not that intimidating. The only thing that it means is you have more than a couple of nodes. <coughs> that is it. You're using more than one set of equations. Ooh. So scary. <laughs> so in web development, there's, of course, a lot of different things you can do with machine learning and neural networks. Like you can predict user behavior based on their patterns on how they move around your website. You can make these personalized interfaces, which we'll get into today. And you can always find areas for improvement. So say you have a lot of data around how users, I don't know, move through a shopping cart. You can figure out how to optimize that process and get more users through it based on the data that you already have. You just have to train a model. And that's when we get to framework data. This makes it really, really easy. So, one of the reasons I chose this over TensorFlow when I was trying to figure out which library to go with with JavaScript is because it's a lot easier to pick up. How many of you have tried using TensorFlow.js? How long did it take you to figure out what the heck the tensor was and how to use that in a meaningful way? Because it took me a lot longer than it did with BrainJS. And with BrainJS, you don't have to have as much of a background in machine learning. So you can just look at their documents and figure out which algorithm would probably work best for your needs. You don't have to go through the whole, oh, what kind of error do I need on this? How do I determine if I need a recurring neural network or just a regular one? You can have machine learning people figure that out for you, but if you just want to integrate it into your app, you don't have to worry about all that crap. <laughs> and the best part about BrainJS is that some of the easiest to follow tutorials where you can pretty much get started making an app in maybe two or three minutes. All you have to do is watch a couple of videos. You don't have to dig into a whole lot of documentation unless you want to. It's just really lightweight and easy to get up and running. So now we'll get into the part I'm sure you've been waiting for, the technical part. And we'll talk about how to decide which features you should use for your model. So one of the things that we as tech people sometimes get wrapped up in is 
what we're going to do. So what are we going to write with our React app? What are we going to do with our APIs? But you really need to focus on what's going to add the most value for a user, especially when you're thinking in UI and UX. Always think about the user. So when you're looking at features, this should be one of the first questions you ask yourself. And then this is the second one. A lot of companies have this, um, I'm going to say, interesting idea where they think if you buy a lot of data, you can magically get information from it. That is not true. So you need to know what data you want from your user so you can figure out how to get it. For example, if you're trying to figure out if you have a malicious user on your website, you can look at just how they're typing in things into your inputs. So if you start seeing a lot of SQL strings or JavaScript code in inputs, that could let you know, hey, this is a malicious user, and you get that information by logging what's in those inputs. So that's just one of the things you can do. And then think about what are you trying to predict. So this kind of ties into what will be valuable for the user in that you can't make your model tell you what you want it to. You have to know what you want your model to tell you. It's not a mind reader yet in place, but you have to know what you're trying to predict. So are you looking for malicious users? Are you trying to figure out where to place elements on the screen? Are you trying to figure out how you should word your content? That's what you're figuring out when you're going through this feature process. And then this one is fun. Will the user actually care if you make the update? So there's a lot of updates that come out that not a whole lot of people really care about, even if it is helpful. So before you invest the time in integrating machine learning into your UI UX, make sure you have a case where they would actually care or it would just improve their overall experience with your application. And now we're going to talk about training the model. So this is where we get into a little code. Make sure it works last night. But <laughs> we all know how that is. Can you guys see that okay? Do you know? Okay. Uh, no? Or go ahead. Okay. That's good. Okay. So basically, I'm going to take you through the code for using Brand.js with a really, really simple React app. And I've already had the app running. So this. Uh, <laughs> It's a really basic app. It has a little top bar to kind of mimic what a navigation menu would look like and the screen. How many of you use Lorem Ipsum? Okay, so have you heard of Samuel L. Ipsum? <laughs> this is one of those little random things that I ah, see. There's, you can always get them from your user. 
But just to initialize it, I started with this. And you see it's just an array of objects. And then we have our training output data, which is also just an array of objects. And pretty much the reason that we need these input and output data sets for training is because we have to teach our model what to expect. So when it sees this combination of RGB values, that's going to correspond to a certain combination of neutral light dark values. And basically what this application does is it changes the color scheme kind of for the application. That is, it, that's what this model does. And that could help users if they have preferences for certain colors on your page, or if you just want to mess with them and change stuff. Probably don't do that, but it's just an example of one of the things you can do with UI UX. And then we get down here where we actually train our model. So we go ahead and make a new neural network. And I'm giving it three hidden layers, so this makes it a deep learning model, because I have three nodes. And then we go ahead and just train it with the data we had. So now you have a machine learning model that is ready to get user input and give you a prediction for what they would prefer to see on their screen. And that's all it took. A couple of arrays and a few method calls. That is why I love BrainJS, because that is all it takes. So the way that you use it is you can have, you know, your backend requests and we'll get data from the user just through their mouse coordinates, or at least that's how I did it in this application. So, sorry, I, had, I got in yesterday and I caught a cold almost immediately. <laughs> but this is the front end that you see. Not that. But this, this is the front end. So you see we update our stars. I'm just changing the opacity for now. We can change one of those values later if you want to. But Anytime that the user moves around on the screen, it's going to record the RGB values for the element that they're hovering over at the moment. And based on what it figures out, so here we get those inputs, and it sends it to our back end, where we do some magical machine learning stuff, which really is very magical. This is it. This is how you predict what kind of colors a user would want, or you predict what kind of words a user would want to see. You can pretty much plug and play with this, and it is so great. But we get our user input, we come back here, we update our training data, so we get our new inputs, we use our model to get the updated outputs, and we send that back to the program, and it updates the opacity. So for now, let's see if it actually works because I know something's going to happen. Something happened. Because of rules. But before it happens again, and I actually have to take through this in the book, I want to make sure that you can see the change that it made. So do you notice how the opacity for the screen changed? So that's kind of what this particular application does. But what the model can be applied to, what, I'll ask you, which value do you want to change? R, G, or B, or R, B, G? R.
in the use of moves around and change that R value. And what this can do, let's say you want to start your website off with dark thing because everybody likes dark thing, right? But your users actually wanted to see something else and they have other colors they subconsciously move to on your page. It sounds like something that wouldn't make that big of a difference, but you would be surprised how much color affects how long the user stays on an application. So, I don't know if you noticed, but this is not orange. That is some shade of purple. I don't know, I'm a little colorblind, so it might be purple. But basically what this did is we pre-trained the model with that input data set, and it gives us back this. Our model was already there, and we just changed which value was being updated. So that's one of the cool things you can do with an application like this. So we've actually gone through training that, and you've seen how to make updates using that model. And pretty much what you're going to see now, I wanted to show you kind of a comparison between Brain and TensorFlow just so you can see the difference in how you set up the model, because it is definitely different. So, I want you to notice a couple things first. Our input training data and our output training data are just arrays of objects, right? Everybody knows how to work with an array of objects, yes? Okay, then when we come over to TensorFlow, we have a 2D tensor that is an array of arrays. And I'm still not quite sure why, just why. <laughs> it's one of those things that you really have to dig into the documentation to figure out when you would use a 2D tensor versus a 1D, or how, what shape the input should be. Whereas with BrainJS, you just figure objects and put them in there and it works. And then down here with the training for TensorFlow, you see you have to know what kind of model you want to use. With BrainJS you also do, but they have more of a, I guess I would say, a personal approach. So they walk you through this is what this model is and you would use it in these cases. With TensorFlow, they're just like, yeah, you should know this stuff already. Use it. But that's just one of the differences between the two. Um, you really have to get into the documentation to truly understand how TensorFlow works because it is interesting. But something else that I wanted to show you guys is application in particular is that you can use anything on the page for input to your model. Anything that you can think of. If you want to figure out how to make a user go through a certain process and you aren't sure what that process is up front, then this is one of the cases you would do that. Or for accessibility, which is really huge, you can use machine learning to actually change the font sizes or even the contrast on a page to match what a user really needs to see based on how they interact with your application. So machine learning has a lot of room in web development. It just takes being creative to really figure out where you should use it, just because it's a really good tool doesn't mean it should be used everywhere. But when you can find those particular applications for it, it becomes something that you cannot live without because it does so much work for you. And one thing that we're trying to get into, at least with BrainJS, is more of the um, unsupervised machine learning, where basically you take the input and you just tell the model to go learn. So I'm not, I'm not sure, are you guys familiar with Boston Dynamics? <laughs> Have you seen the newest pet med? 
That thing is ridiculous. So it uses all those supervised machine learning to figure out how to move around landscape. And that's something that we can do with the web when it comes to different devices that people are using, or we fit into the situation where we have people in different countries that need different cultural contexts. That's a really interesting application I've seen for machine learning in the web development setting. So, there are a few things that I will only do besides this incredible thing. The biggest thing and probably the hardest thing that I've seen for web developers is finding those uncommon ways to apply machine learning. It's something that takes a lot of discipline and practice so you can really see, oh, this is a great place for machine learning. It'll help improve everything. And with BrainJS and stuff like that, you don't have to have this super large server or backend. You can run the stuff in the browser using the user's GPU, which is really cool. And then you can use BrainJS to handle web app machine learning. As you can see, it's pretty simple to get started with. And again, I know I keep not content with folk, but it's really powerful if you want to get into the machine learning algorithms. And one last thing is that machine learning can really help improve UI UX on an individual level. So you don't have to think of every little thing that a person might want or that a person might do on the page because you have a model that's working alongside them where it will do some of those updates for you and you might not necessarily know that it needed to. And another great thing about it is that that data is constantly being recorded. So if you want it to store it somewhere or in like a text file or something, you can always come back and reference it later. You're just getting more data to work with. So really, I'm going to leave it open to questions if you guys have any. Really. Yes. So the updates um, happen live, or is it everyone who's able to The updates happen live. But you can have it where if you needed a delay or something, you could program it to where it would happen when they rewrote the page. Not on the front end part of it. So he asked if BrainJS takes into account performance on mobile devices, is that right? So not, not in particular. If you wanted to run it on a mobile device or you know you need it cross-platform, then you would probably go with the server-side version of it. And then as far as performance for training that model, you could check for like the, the error on the data or on the model after it goes through so many iterations, if you have a certain tolerance that you can be within, that could also save you on performance. Anything else? Yes. No, not at the moment. You have to have both input and output training data. Any questions? Thank you.